Okay, I'm sorry, uh, I can't be in Mainz to, to give this talk. When I think of Mainz, I think of the Rhine, and when I think of the Rhine, I think of the Lorelei, who's mysteriously attractive, has great allure. When El Elisbetta, oh my, now what's happening? Now it won't, oh. When she invited me to, asked me to give this talk, I asked what I should talk about. So she said, you can talk about this and that. So here's my talk outline, this and that. Okay, this. So first I'll talk about some history. Uh, the, the proton is the oldest hadron we have. Uh, it's been, uh, it, we just celebrated a few years ago, we celebrated its 100th year anniversary. So uh, I was curious about it and I, and I just, looked on the internet, I found a sketch of his apparatus. And what he did, what he did, was, it's really interesting. What he did is he had a low pressure chamber and he had a source, he had a surface, he had a metal surface that he coated with radium. So radium gives a lot of alpha particles range, uh, you know, five MeV up to eight MeV or something like that. And uh, so then he, and then in this chamber, he had a gas at low pressure and he had a, a thin gold, uh, silver window. So the window was thick enough to stop any of the alpha particles. The alpha particles have a very short range of material. So the, it, no alpha particles could get out of this chamber because of this uh, silver window. And on the outside of the window, he had a, 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 a phosphor and then an eyepiece. And then he had his assistant, uh, Marsden or Geiger look here, look for flashes. And what he found is, in spite of the fact he had this window here and everything's closed up, he found he got counts. And uh, so, and then he examined what happened when you put different gases in. And he found he got most counts when he had nitrogen gas. So what Rutherford figured out was that he was having a reaction. The alphas would come from the surface, interact with the nitrogen gas, and then produce oxygen 17 plus proton. So that was the, that, that was the discovery of the proton. Uh, the uh, other thing he discovered, this is the first transmutation, first identified transmutation of, of nuclei. So this is the first example of alchemy, okay? He, he uh, transformed nitrogen into oxygen. And then the other thing he discovered was nobody had never known that oxygen had a number 17 isotope. So he inferred the existence of that, okay. So that was a hundred years ago. And so the proton has been around for a hundred years. What do you learn? What's new to learn about the proton? Well, the first thing new I learned was that Rutherford didn't discover the proton. In fact, the proton was discovered by this guy here, Eugene, uh, Eugene Goldstein. Is a German fact. Actually, he was born in a part of Poland that subsequently became part of Germany. Uh, and so, and he, he had a laboratory in Potsdam. And this was in, in, 19, in 1886, which was even before the electrons discovered. He was looking at discharges in a, in a low pressure gas tube. He had a cathode and an anode, and he was looking at uh, uh, currents that go between the cathode and anode. And for some reason, he made slots in his anode. And on the far side of his tube, he put a phosphor. So if a charged particle hit it, it would make a flash. And so what he discovered was when he had the gas in the tube, then he would get a current from the cathode, uh, from the, uh, cathode to the anode. These are called these cathode rays. These were electrons now, but nobody knew about electrons then. And then these electrons would ionize the gas. And so if it was hydrogen gas, they would produce protons. And the protons be attracted to the cathode, but since the cathode had holes in it, they would keep going and flash on his screen. So he was the first person to see uh, protons. Now his associate, uh, William Wein, Wien, Wien, this is the Wien displacement law, Wien. He took the, he used the apparatus and put a magnet here and he measured the charge to mass ratio. And he found that he got the right charge. I mean, he didn't get the right, he measured the charge to mass ratio for hydrogen. 
And that's the, the value we, we know today within some era. Okay. So he was, so, this, so Goldstein and Wien, they're the first fellows, first people to see protons, but they didn't know about electrons and they didn't know about the Rutherford atom. Rutherford, he knew about both electrons and he knew about the Rutherford atom. So he gets credit for discovering protons, but he wasn't first, okay. Now, what happened, uh, so then in 1956, a lot of things happened to proton. It was the proton that uh, people used to discover spin, not the electron, in fact. But another thing, the important discovery for the proton happened in 1956. Hofstadter uh, did experiment, and he showed that the proton was not a point particle. This, uh, this formula was for electrons uh, for uh, electrons scattering on point particles. This the Mott formula uh, would give an angular distribution that looked like this. But rather, uh, Hofstadter found that angular distribution that was uh, steeper. This is the scattering angle, and this is the differential cross section versus scattering angle. So this is the Mott cross section, and this is the cross section that Hofstadter measured. So Rosenbluth had given a formula anticipating that the proton was not a point particle. And this, pro, this formula has now the famous form factors, the uh, Fermi and Dirac form factors. And this gives you the discrepancy between the Mott formula and the measurement. And that can be extracted. And, and he fitted this with a, with, a, with a charge distribution, an exponential charge distribution. And he got the form factor. And the the the, uh, the slope of this charge distribution is just the radius of the photon, which for this form he, he found to be 0.8 uh, uh, Fermi's. Okay. And he fitted to other forms too, and then he ended up publishing result 0.77 Fermi's with a with a respectable error. So Hofstadter won the Nobel Prize about 1961 or something like that for this. Okay, so now what's happened five decades later? Five decades later, now remember, uh, Hofstadter measured it to be about 0.8 here with an error that goes up to here someplace. And uh, now, uh, 50 years later, the measurements are about a, one of Hofstadter's standard deviations higher with uh, 1 20th the error. But the trouble is, if you use the value that uh, COVID, CODATA, co that's the particle data book for all, all of fundamental, fundamental parameters, this is the book that keeps all the charge of the electron and the mass of the proton, et cetera. So their value for the radius of the proton is 0 0.87, 88 Fermi's. And that's what you get here in Mainz. But with the same data, if you go to Bonn, if you go down the river, uh, 150 kilometers, you get this value here. So you get a difference, okay? So that it's, it's, uh, it's uh, people don't agree on how to analyze the data. Now, the reason is, is you, you don't measure the radius of the, elect, of the photon. This is the electric radius. R sub E is the electric radius. You don't measure the radius of the, of the proton. You measure its electric form factor. And then you have to extrapolate, not the form factor you measure, but its derivative to Q squared equal to zero. So it's not a simple measurement. Okay. And there are different ways to do it. So uh, like here, uh, an exponential, an exponential uh, in uh, space turns into a dipole. This is that, uh, this is the so-called dipole form factor. This is the form factor you would get if there, if, if the uh, charge density was uh, perfect, uh, was, uh, was an exponential. This is, this is kind of the standard people use. But the, the, the form factor is not a simple dipole like this because the nucleons have pion clouds and they produce bumps in this G sub E factor. And that's illustrated here. So these are measurements of G sub E by the uh, Mainz group, the Mami accelerator. So this is the measurements of G sub E here and the electric dipole and the, uh, the electric uh, form factor and the magnetic form factor. 
divided by the dipole. The, uh, this is, the dipole is what the Hofstad I was measuring. And you can see there are big discrepancies. The, at the percent, a few percent level, there's big discrepancies. In particular, in the magnetic dipole, it's, it's very pronounced. There's a big, uh, there's, a, there's a pronounced bump at uh, 0.15 GeV squared. And that's associated with this pion cloud. So this bump should also be in the electron, uh, uh, the electron form factor, but at a lower level, but it's there. So anyway, so it's not a simple business to extrapolate the derivative. You're not extrapolating the value of the form factor, but the derivative. You have to use some models or something. So there are two approaches. The mice approach is to just use polynomial fits or spline fits. They're based on some, they're model motivated, they're not out of the blue. And then use that to fit the data. And this nicely explained here by these two, two guys here. And uh, the bond group that does a different, they extract the pion cloud from measurements of low, low energy measurements of E plus E minus goes to pi plus pi minus, and also for pi nucleon scattering data. And they include an analytic expression for this into a dispersion relation, and they get the different answer. So they get different results. And uh, so that was in 2010, uh, 2009, 2010. But then in 2010, the whole field changed because people at PSI at uh, Switzerland learned how to make muonic hydrogen and make precise measurements of the muonic hydrogen lampshift. In ordinary hydrogen, the electron is here uh, half an angstrom away from the nucleus. The electron's wave function, even in the ground state, barely ever touches the nucleus. And so the, 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 the effect of the size of the proton on the lamp shift is very small. It's, uh, it's uh, one, one hundredth of a percent or something like that. On the other hand, if you could do the same, if you could measure the lamp shift with a muonic atom, which is a muon going around the uh, nucleus, the radius of the muon is 200 times smaller. So the root muons uh, wave function overlaps the nucleus more even in the 2p state. And so then the muonic hydro hydrogen, the effect of the nuclear, nu the, ray, the effect of the radius of the proton, the, the amount that the muon scrapes along the surface of the proton is uh, rather large. It's a 2% effect, so it's a big difference here. So the measurement is, is quite simple. You, 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 well, it's not simple because you have to make the muonic hydrogen. But if you can make muonic hydrogen and you can make it in a, in a, in a metastable 2S state, I mean, when you make it, some of it ends up in a, a few percent ends up in a, a metastable 2S state. And then you shoot a, a terahertz uh, laser in, you excite, you excite this, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, transition here to the 2P state. And when it goes to the 2P state, the 2P three half state is unstable and, and then that decays right away to a two kilovolt X-ray. So if you have this muonic hydrogen, you shoot in the laser and you, and you look in coincidence if you get a, a, a two kilovolt X-ray out and they get this beautiful peak here. And the only trouble with this peak here is this peak is at the wrong place. If we use the 8.88 fem, fem, uh, Fermi uh, radius for the proton, the peak would be away off the edge of the scale. In fact, when they first did the experiment, they couldn't find the peak. And then only after a long time, they realized they should try down here and then they found it, okay? So then this make, they can make a very, very precise measurement of the radius of the proton. So here is the, uh, QED calculation for the lamp shift in muonium muonic hydrogen. And then here's the Q, QED calculation for the effect of a, of a non uh, of, of a proton's radius. And you can see it's a 2% effect. And uh, you can measure this R squared quite precisely. And they do that, and it comes right on the bond solution and not the line solution. 
So 66 years after Hofstadter, we still don't know the nuclear radius, the, the proton radius, any better than 5%. That's about what Hofstadter had at 56 years ago. So it's a big mystery. So there's a huge amount of work now uh, going on in both the EP scattering community and the hydrogen spectroscopy communities to figure out what's going on. And right now it's a very, very fluid situation, but we will, when it gets settled, probably in the next few years, we'll have learned a lot of new physics from this 130 year old proton, okay? So a hundred years later, the proton is still a source of interesting puzzles. So here's part two of my talk that I wanna talk about Hadron thresholds, but I don't want to talk about hadron thresholds for doubly charmed particles, etc., like that. I want to talk about hadron thresholds for ordinary particles. Okay. So here we talked about the protons form factor. This protons form factor we've been talking about and have been measured since 1956 are all in the space like region. But this form factor is connected by uh, crossing symmetry with. Uh, form factors in the time-like time region. Well, here you have proton, anti-proton goes to E plus E minus, or vice versa, proton, E plus E minus goes to proton, anti-proton. And it's the same analytic function that works here is supposed to work here. And it's supposed to work in between here, although it's not so easy to measure. So uh, the, 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 world, the, 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 the history of the proton is we know the we know the form factors here quite well. With the proviso, we don't know the radius of the proton so well. But uh, there's been hundreds of experiments, and these experiments can measure the electric form factor and the magnetic form factor and the polarization form factor. And I also gave uh, Professor Hofstadter a Nobel Prize. And, uh, but in the, in the time-like region, we're not so fortunate. Very little data. And we can't measure the individual form factors, in, except in rare cases, and then not with great precision. So we measure this effective form factor. The form factors are interesting because they're complex, and here they're real. And but here it's also interesting because hadron form, hyperon form factors are accessible. So let's talk a little bit about uh, E plus E minus. Uh, I'm only going to talk about E plus E minus goes to uh, Baryon, anti-baryon, not the, not the reverse reaction. So E plus E minus goes to P, P bar at threshold. So uh, these are the, the, over here, just for the sideways, over here we have the, uh, these are the form factors in the formula I showed you before. But uh, in this business, we really like to use this combination, the Sachs form factors, okay? This is the equivalent of the, of the uh, Roughly speaking, this is the equivalent of the Fourier transform of the electric charge distribution, and this is the Fourier transform of the magnetic charge distribution, or whatever you call magnetic charge. Anyway, in terms of these form factors and their effectiveness, the effective combination here, in terms of the effective combination here, I should say at a zero at threshold, these two are supposed to be equal, so it's not a it's not a complicated thing. So the cross section is given by this factor here, this QCD factor here, times a beta, which is a phase space factor. This is the velocity of the proton in the center of mass frame. And then there's a term C here, and then times the form factor as the function of the PP bar center of mass energy, and uh, then more of this phase space here. So for point-like charged particles, this C factor is this complicated expression. It's a, it's a so-called Sommerfeld resummation factor. So it's pi alpha over beta divided by this. You go to beta equals zero, you extend to beta goes to zero. And this is pi alpha over beta. Now this factor takes into account the effect. Remember, if you have, a, if you have a two charged particles, uh, the Coulomb states, you have an uh, infinite number of Coulomb states right below thresholds if they're charged particles. And so then this affects the uh, turn on here. Okay. Now, what's interesting here is, is this factor. 
1 over beta, because here we have a beta, the phase space factor in this expression, but then C has a 1 over beta. So that means that when you go to the threshold, the cross section goes to zero, doesn't go to zero with phase, with uh, well, like phase space, but it has a finite value. So like, not, like nothing you ever thought of before. Here you come to the threshold for two, if this is a point-like particle, for two point-like particles, uh, right at threshold, the cross section makes an abrupt jump, at least uh, to the extent of the approximations that go into the QED calculus. And then above that, you have some phase space rise. Now, this is not such a, this is a, this is a, a, a very familiar formula. We, we've been measuring the tau mass for many years. And the cross section that we use, we, we measure it by trying to discover the threshold. And we're helped because at the cross section we're trying to use, we have a jump like this. In the formula we use, we have a jump like this. In the case of the tau lepton, this is about two or 300 picobombs. But that makes the uh, threshold more distinct and that helps uh, our measurement. We've never been able to see this directly because we don't have the resolution, but it's there in all the fitting formulas we do. So it's a very strange, thing. You go to a threshold and the cross-section jumps. There's no phase space at all. And then you have phase space turnover. Now, what do we measure for the proton? Well, here is data from Babar. Here, here is data from Babar and also from this CMD experiment at, at Novosibirsk. And then recently, or not so recently anymore, but uh, a few years ago, they made a scan right at threshold. So these points here are at MEV apart. And you can see right at threshold, the PP bar cross section jumps. It, it, it jumps from zero because it's below threshold and it jumps to 850 picobombs, which is just this cross section here for the, for the jump here. It, the effective form factor is supposed to be one at the threshold. So it, it, this jump is 0.85 nanobonds, 850 picobonds. It's very, very remarkable because the proton is not point-like. We've just been talking about the proton is, a, is 0.85 Fermi's or 0.84 or 0.8, depending whether you're in Mainz or in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Bonn, okay? So it's inconsistent with theory. So the, these theorists, again, these are the Bond theorists, they tried to fit the data, the, the Abad data and the Novosibirsk data uh, with final state interactions. And they were able to get a, a sharp increase like this. But this increase occurred over a, a, a range in energy of about 15 MeV. The measurement, the, the, the increase occurs in a, in a distance, in an energy range less than one MeV. So it's really, really remarkable. And the other thing that's interesting is this final state is dominated by low energy nuclear physics. We have electron positrons going to quarks and then the quarks hadronize into, <coughs> into protons and antiprotons are very low energy. So all kinds of low energy physics going on, but somehow the cross section comes out exactly, not exactly, but within, within close range of this 850 picobonds that you would calculate if you had treated the proton as a point-like particle. And then it's strange also because it goes on. But very, very peculiar. And as far as I know, nobody really understands this. Now, what about neutral variants? Okay. So in this case, the same formula holds, except now, the C factor is one because there are no none of this uh, none of these Rydberg states are below threshold. So, so in this case, you expect no jump if it was point-like. If the neutron and anti-neutron was point-like, or if the lambda lambda bar was point-like, there would be no jump. It would just grow as the phase space goes grow as beta. But the measurements been done. This was done by BES three and SND and. DM2, and, and you can see that you can see that there's a jump right at the threshold. It's not 850 picobonds. It looks more like 500 picobonds, but it's a jump. 
And it really, this SMD did very careful threshold measurements, and it occurs within one or two MeV of the threshold. So it's a different, it goes up a different amount, about two thirds to PP bar one, but it's just as fast. So it's very strange. Okay. So the initial state, the quarks are point particles. Okay, that's an interesting problem. The, the, the initial state quarks are point particles. So you have this here, the, the cross section. In this case, if we were just looking at quarks, then we would have the charge of the quark squared times this um, the point like cross section, this 850, um, uh, 850 picobonds. Okay. So they're curious, and then, but at, in the final state, the nucleons are the point particles. The nuclei, I mean, the nucleons are, are, not, are the point particles, because in the final state, with one MeV above threshold, the proton and the antiproton, their characteristic distance is the low energy PP bar scattering length, which is given by this formula here, which is about seven. Fermi's or something like that. So here the characteristic distance is the virtual photon, which is about 0.1 Fermi, which is much smaller than the size of the proton. And up here it's seven Fermi's, which is much bigger than the size of the proton. So it's kind of a hard thing to get your thoughts around. But what's interesting is the sum, incoherent sum of the quark charges are given by this. So for a proton, incoherent sum of these charges is one. And the point cross section is 850 picobonds. So that's what you guess that somehow this was the correct formula. Uh, and that's what we measure. Okay. And for the neutron, it's not so different. It's two thirds. And so we would guess that you would get 570 picobonds and we measure or we measure 500 picobonds. So the, it, it, it seems like somehow if you make this incoherent sum of the quark charges squared, you get the right answer. But uh, so this makes some predictions. So for the for the uh, lambda, you'd expect about 400 picobonds. For the sigma zero, you'd expect about 350 picobonds, etc. So let's look at the lambda. So we measured the lambda. And the lambda is uh, instead of 400, we measure 300. One, one MeV above the threshold, we get 300 uh, picobonds. The, the previous slide, the prediction was 400 picobonds. What about the other ones? The sigma zero, sigma, there's no jump. It looks just like a theorist would draw. And for the cascade zero, there's no bump, uh, no, no obvious bump. The cross section is smaller. So no bumps at all. But for the cascade, uh, the, the lambda C plus lambda C minus, right at threshold, there's a jump, 225 picobonds. If we calculate it with this formula I gave you before with the cas lambda C mass, we get 145 picobonds. So this is a this is a this is a cross section. The beta here is 0.025. Okay, the beta over here is 0.15. So it's like seven times difference. The phase space is seven times difference between this point and this point. But this point is right there. It's just one MeV above the threshold. And you can see in the data, there's, it's, there's nothing mysterious. There's no background or anything fishy. You can just go there and count the number of events. They're very, very clean. It's amazing. Okay. So the lambda and lambda bar, these theorists uh, who, who fit the uh, PP bar uh, cross section that I showed you earlier, they also tried to fit the lambda lambda bar, but they can't accommodate this lowest energy point. They can squeeze in these other points, but they can't accommodate this low energy point. So it can't be explained by final state interactions. Okay. So they're adding quark charges doesn't work. Uh, for things go. So what else is going on? Well, the, the jump in cross section is occurs because of things that go on in below the threshold. So in the unphysical region. So this would correspond to bound states of the nucleons. And uh, you know, so this would be uh, the name for these things are baryonium. So this would be a 
one minus minus baryonium, you could produce that, for example, E plus E minus goes to PP bar or lambda lambda, uh, excuse me, for PP bar or, or whatever. And uh, so we had this jump in the lambda lambda bar cross section. So we, it was suggested we look at the, uh, that the, at the cross section for E to K plus K minus K plus K minus because below threshold, the lambda lambda bar would have to decay to strange particles. And sure enough, right at the, right at the lambda threshold, we saw a jump in the 4K on cross section. And curiously, the Baba people also measured this cross section and they saw a jump in the same place with, uh, with uh, somewhat higher error loads. And in these jump, these events here are almost all KK, KK phi. And so here it looks more prominent. It's the same data, so you can't, uh, can't count it twice, but it's, here it looks more prominent. It's about a three and a half standard deviation effect, but it's right at the lambda, lambda bar threshold, very strange. So it very, looks very nice. We should try to get more data. Yeah, we desperately need more data. <coughs> But the best three experiment keeps doing other things. Okay, so now what about I, that? That was the one minus minus PP bus systems. What about the zero minus plus? The one minus minus is uh, S wave with the two spins parallel. The zero minus plus is the S wave with the two spins anti parallel. You can produce this in J psi goes to gamma BB bar. So for, for for uh, proton, antiproton, PP bar. This is curious because this was first proposed by Fermi and Yang in 1949, before the antiproton was discovered. They tried to make the pion out of a proton, antiproton bound state, which is that this, this that ended up being a classic paper. This stimulated Sakata's three, uh, uh, the Sakata model. And the Sakata model inspired Gelman's quark model. So it's, uh, it's an interesting subject with a huge history. It's another subject with a huge history. So in the BES experiment, the best two experiments, prede predecessor of the one we have now, we saw in the gamma, J psi goes to gamma PP bar, we saw a, a huge enhancement <coughs> at uh, threshold. The cross sections keep going up at threshold. And, uh, and uh, so we interpret it, here's, here, here is what phase space would look like. Okay, so very different. So we, in, the interpretation of this is that with some, is if it's a PP bar bound state, if you have a PP bar bound state, when you're below threshold, it's not stable because the P and the P bar can annihilate. So the P and P bar annihilate and they can go to mesons, go to gluons, they annihilate to gluons. And then these gluons can, will become, will have to become mesons. So uh, these guys suggested pi plus pi minus eta prime because the eta prime is uh, famous for containing a lot of uh, gluons. And so you'd have this cross section, you would have this resonance like this, which would only occur in pi pi eta prime or other light hadrons, not just pi pi eta prime, but other light hadrons. But then above the threshold, they should chop off and then they should become proton, anti-proton. That was kind of the scheme proposed by these guys. And so we looked at the pi pi a the prime and sure enough, we saw, a, we saw a peak and it straddled the threshold. Here's the two proton threshold. So this was, this was in, uh, oh, it must have been in 2005 or something like that. And uh, so it, it's kind of consistent with uh, these numbers were kind of consistent with the numbers uh, that we found in the PP channel. With the best three, we have lots more data. So here we have like 10 times more data and we're able to do partial wave analysis and it came out to be zero minus plus, which we would expect for a proton antiproton uh, in, a, in an even charge conjugation, in an odd conjugation, excuse me, even charge conjugation state. And it, was, and it was, had a mass at the same mass as the pi pi eta prime and a narrow width. And uh, then with more, even more data studying this pi pi eta prime, 
Hello? Hello? With even more data, with the pi pi eta prime, we, we, we see this, uh, we see a, uh, we don't see a, now this is pi pi eta prime. This, this what looked like a peak before is clearly not a peak and it has this huge interference pattern. And it's clearly at right at, it's centered right at the two times the mass of the proton. So it's, uh, if we do, we, if we try to characterize this, this shape with the Flatte formula, this Flatte formula takes into account uh, the different phase space and the different channel when you when the resonance crosses the channel, I won't go through it. But we can do a fit, and you can get the coupling of this resonance to proton antiproton. That's this one, or the coupling to everything like mesons. And you can see the coupling is two and a half times bigger for PP bar than for light mesons. This isn't the case for any other mesons in this uh, in this region. This coupling. It's unlike any other meson. So there's, there's something going on in the PP bar system. So after 130 years of the proton discovered by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Goldstein, we're still learning huge amounts of stuff about the proton. And that's just the proton. If you go on to, you know, I, I ran out of time. In fact, I used all my time up plus part of the next speaker. If you go to the if you go to the next step, the rest of my talk was about the light scale of mesons. They're forty years old, and we still got lots of stuff to learn. So I just uh, skip it over, and I come to my summary. It is this is what uh, we you know in the U.S. All my generation learned their physics from B.J. Bjorkheim, and he said it's important to pay attention to the difficulties in a subject rather than the successes. It is in thinking about the difficulties more than in celebrating the progress that advances are made. And, you know, this is Hadron physics in a nutshell. This is why Hadron physics is so interesting. It's full of puzzles. There's lots to learn, even with the very oldest Hadrons, okay? So work hard at this workshop, and I'm sorry I overran my time. Thank you, Steve, for this very nice talk. It's uh, really motivating. Um, yeah, so this uh, threshold behavior is uh, it's really puzzling and uh, thanks for this introduction. Uh, so uh, first of all, let me ask if, uh, if there are any questions. <clears throat> so we still have some time. I would like to make a, <clears throat> a comment about this uh, threshold effect that you mentioned. It might be that uh, <clears throat> what you see is not a baryonium state, but rather a tetra quark. Um, so <clears throat> I, I'll talk about it uh, <clears throat> later in my talk, but I think that uh, there is a way that tetra quarks <clears throat> break up uh, into a uh, baryon antibaryon, and in particular, lambda C, lambda C bar. And uh, I, I wonder whether it can. <clears throat> Uh, resolve these issues that you mentioned. Uh, you got to produce them without any phase space. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, if that, 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 that's a good argument, maybe that we should investigate more whether this pi pi eta prime resonance is a, is a diquark, anti diquark. That's what you mean. And maybe, and maybe that's what's going on at the lambda threshold. That, 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 that's possible. Yeah, I, I was thinking right. about that after we discussed that this morning, and this may be a good a, a good angle. Yeah, we should mm -hmm. talk more about it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So maybe I have a quick one. So you mentioned that for some of the neutral ones, uh, we don't see these uh, threshold enhancements. Right? And also even for PP bar, it depends on the production. E plus E minus seems to produce a bump. And I believe in uh, side twists, some modes, I, I don't remember, uh, you don't see bumps. 
right? No, it's uh, the, the side the side 2s we haven't really settled the issue. We it's, it may be or may not be. I, I, I don't I don't think uh, maybe Changzhen Changzhen probably. I, I think Changzhen's attached to probably you know. But, uh, Okay, so uh, so maybe we follow up in the discussion. This is this is I think very interesting. Um, uh, so thanks again, Steve, for this uh, very nice introduction to the war, and uh, I think this was uh, an excellent talk and, and very also very motivating. And you you uh, I like the fact that you went back to the old head hedrons. <laughs> so that's very good. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, so.